Hey folks, let's spend some time with friends up north. Pat Kreitlow of Up North News is on Lake Wissota. Sarah Yacoub of the Monaco Brewing Company Super Pack is on the Mississippi River. And up on Lake Monaco is Kirk Bangstead of the Monaco Brewing Company. Wherever you are, welcome. You're up north. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Up North Podcast. I'm Kirk Bangstead from the Monaco Brewing Company. I'm Sarah Yaku from the Monaco Brewing Company Super Pack. And Pat Kreitlow from Up North News. WI.com is back this week. Welcome back, Pat. Did you guys miss me at all? Do you even notice? Oh my God, <laughs> oh my God Pat. Uh, it's like, you, it's like, it's like we're, we're sitting on hot coals when you're not here. Uh, you know, every so often you gotta, you, I, I'm just those, those training wheels that have to go away every now and then just to make sure that, you know, you've got the balance for this, but um, no, thanks you guys for Fill in the gap. Um, my wife had a work trip, so we decided to bookend it with some visits uh, to the southeastern part of the country. We were in Charlotte and Charleston and Hilton Head. And um, after that much time in the Carolinas and Georgia, I am here to tell you that is one beautiful part of the country. The folks there are as nice as you will ever want to meet. All that Southern hospitality stuff is absolutely true. That said, if you let any of those people run the country, they will drive it right into the ground because I spent time <laughs> talking to some of the locals. I wanted to see in some rather spirited discussions at, at some watering holes, if, if logic could get them to believe in science and if compassion could get them to look out for the well-being of strangers. But in the end, COVID to them is still no different than the flu. The vaccine is still too mysterious to trust and everyone should be on their own. And again, these, these were nice folks, every one of them. I am sure they go to church and preach a good gospel, but boy, when it comes to living the gospel the other six and a half days a week, it appears to be as impossible as what that good book says about a camel going through the eye of a needle. Um, but still, it was a very nice time, only to have me return trusting you guys to run the place for one week and you let in the snow. I, I, I come back to a, a front yard full of, full of the white stuff. It's here already. But thankfully, thankfully, I had one last remnant of summer to think about uh, just minutes ago when Corbin Burns was uh, given the Cy Young Award from the Milwaukee Brewers for one hell of a season. And uh, so it was nice to have a little bit of summer warmth return before those of you watching on the, the video version of our podcast there's no leaves left on the trees here at, uh, at Lake Wissota. So winter is most definitely coming, my friends. <laughs> You're even bundled up, Pat. Are you actually outside uh, on your, in your backyard or no, is that no, just no, but a it's, beautiful it's, it's photo? It's fleece season. It's, 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 time for the, it's time for the little fleece pullover. So we, we got to we gotta, you know, look at you. You're sweatered up, too. And, uh, oh, you know, it's true, man. It's right. And Sarah, I'm a delicate flower, Pat. I need, I need warmth. No oh, you are a delicate yeah. flower. There's no doubt there. Um, <laughs> Sarah, meanwhile, still, still in the, uh, the, the, the torture chamber chair. Um, you know, I'm digging the egg chair, you know, I just kind of get to float and it's fun. And I just hope it doesn't make noise <laughs> during the nope. podcast. No, nope, nope. It does. It does not. Does not at all. Tell you what, in the one minute, uh, we're, we're going to do a lightning round with Sarah here because we're going to be fairly serious in this show. A lot of talk about the Kyle Rittenhouse trial. And it's something that, um, you know, Kirk wanted to, to bring up about, uh, you know, s problems in our judicial system. But uh, Sarah, for those of you, if, if you weren't here when we talked to, you know, when she first joined the show, give us a little bit about your law background and, and why you're looking forward to talking to our guests today. Uh, yes. Well, for one, I'm a nerd. So there's that. But um, also, I was a, a deputy district attorney out in Los Angeles for six years. I interned uh, with the office for, I want to say something, the ballpark of two. I interned in the Santa Barbara district attorney's office for the ballpark of two to three in undergrad. Uh, so to look at this case from a prosecutorial standpoint, and now as a resident living in Wisconsin, from a cultural standpoint, it is just fascinating uh, from an academic standpoint. Sure. And we will uh, talk about that case starting first with the district a district attorney from central Wisconsin coming up right after this break. You're up north. Welcome back to the Up North podcast. I'm Sarah Yacoub. And I'm Kirk Bankstead. And I'm Pat Kreitlow. And we 
Come to you live on Wednesdays as a podcast on the weekends. Our radio hosts at News Talk 92.7 have shows throughout the week that can be heard anywhere in Wisconsin or elsewhere on planet Earth, thanks to the Devil Radio app. And as a podcast, you can catch us weekends on our website, upnorthpodcast.com, and all the usual places where you can subscribe and listen to us. Uh, this show is not affiliated with where you find me in my day job, despite the similar name, but you can go to upnorthnewswi.com or Up North News WI on social media and get fully up to speed on the day's news and top issues. So now it's time for us to get to um, why the Kyle Rittenhouse trial should matter to folks up north, frankly, nationwide, if you care about the courts and a, and a fair court system, but you know why, why it should matter. And so Kirk's going to introduce our first guest. Yeah, so, so my thought was this, you know, Wisconsin is now it's a center of attention with this Kyle Rittenhouse trial. Uh, the trial is uh, about a about a minor uh, uh, having a semi-automatic weapon entering the melee of a of a of a of a, of a race riot uh, and and you know and shooting and killing people and it, we're at the center of attention nationwide. Um, but this is happening down south and. And I thought it would be so great. And I just happened to know Louis Malepsky, who's the district attorney of Portage County. We we grew up in Stevens Point together. We ran cross country together when we were kids. And I was like, how cool would it be if if Louis could actually kind of give us his you know perceptions of of what it means to be a DA, what it means to have to kind of try a case like this. Um, and, and he doesn't just I know also, it from the standpoint of a district attorney. Louis and I also both served together in the legislature back in. 2007 2008 something like that before he became you know a big deal in Portage County circles um, <laughs> he is a big deal but I also know that being a friend of Louie I don't want to get him in the hot water and I know that being a DA an active DA uh, I want to just have Louie so thank you so much for agreeing to do this for one first and foremost but then can you tell us what you're able and not able to talk about here so so our audience kind of understands what where some of the guardrails are because you are an acting da sure and i appreciate the invite to the show um and pat it's good to see you again uh, going down memory road there mm -hmm. but you know this is an open case it's active i represent the state of wisconsin along with the prosecutors we're on the same team so to speak and uh, I'm not going to be commenting on, uh, you know, the choice of the charges or uh, anything uh, about the evidence at this time, you know, really because the jury is deliberating. And even though the jury's not supposed to be listening to this podcast, eh, maybe they are. Um, and let's hope that they follow the judge's instructions. Um, you know, and uh, as far as the judge, uh, I know the judge has gotten some critique in the media uh, for and against, and I'd rather uh, not go too much into uh, you know, hard critique of the judge, uh, as I really don't think that's appropriate. Great. Well, thanks so much, Louie. And so I'm going to, I think we should give the Florida our actual past dis deputy district attorney from LA County, who's got a lot of questions for you. Um, uh, but I guess the first thing is, um, can you just talk to us as a DA, uh, what are your ultimate goal like if you had to try a case like this what do you have to do you have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt in order to get a conviction can you just walk us through the basic steps of of, of like this un, of the underlying trial and what a district attorney needs to actually accomplish in the case well i, I had a trial uh you know somewhat like the rittenhouse case there's a decedent and ultimately uh the the uh, defendant is claiming self-defense uh, that's something that in Wisconsin we call a privilege. Uh, when that's evoked, ultimately the burden is placed upon the state uh, to prove a negative. In other words, that the defendant uh, was uh, that their actual or imminent uh, unlawful interference was not actually there. Um, that the defendant believed that the amount of force was reasonable. You, you try to basically show that was not reasonable in light of the circumstances. I had a case that's now been, uh, the person's uh, been convicted of life in, is in life or a prison. Um, he indicated that uh, he needed to shoot the victim who was about six feet away because he took a minor step toward him possessing no weapon. Uh, the defendant was behind a vehicle like cover with a firearm and shot him in front of his two minor children. And there uh, that the jury found that that was not a proper use of self-defense. And in fact, 
the defendant, if anybody, uh, uh, had lost that right of self-defense, and even if the jury had found it, had provoked, uh, uh, really was provoking the situation by being there. Uh, ultimately, uh, he was uh, interfering in uh, the decedent's new relationship with his ex-wife. So um, these are very uh, fact-specific type of uh, analyses, and your and Sarah, I'm sure, in her experience, has had similar uh, uh, cases. The laws are pretty are similar across the United States. But I'll say one thing for your listeners: uh, when the, when we talk about self-defense, and if there's an area where we want to change policy, that's really where you look at. It's a very broad definition of self-defense and the right to use deadly force. Well, and one of the things that strikes me as so interesting um, in California, when we were making filing decisions, um, the idea of mutual combat or self-defense. Uh, seem very much up front in the filing decisions. So not speaking about any case in particular, if you could help uh, our audience understand, is that something that comes into account at filing or is that something you figure, okay, the defense is going to raise at trial, but we will proceed as though self-defense is not a valid uh, explanation for what is going on here? Well, Sarah, sometimes you're lucky enough to know the defense from the get-go, but in my case, that was not raised until uh, the jury trial. Interesting. Uh, because the defendant in my case had made a partial admission. So we did, So uh, we figured the defendant probably would take the stand because the evidence was so strong, but we, we didn't expect uh, really until they requested the instruction was that they were gonna claim uh, self-defense. Uh, and uh, whether it was a perfect or imperfect self-defense type of scenario. And that uh, was interesting. Uh, because one thing you cannot do, uh, you can't say, uh, well, this is the first time we're hearing about this because it really gets into the area of the defendant's silence where he did not make statements about a certain aspect of it, which is his right not to. Uh, so that's a balancing t uh, for the for the prosecutor. Sometimes it seems, well, you know, of course you're going to talk about it. Well, you got to be careful. Well, and, um, you know, you bring up an interesting point with Doyle error, which for our friends at home is a, a DA or a prosecutor doing what Louis just said, uh, commenting on someone exercising their Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination or their silence. Um, but Louis, you know, what do you think, or, you know, I imagine there's cases on point, none are coming to mind, but before someone is Mirandized, so after the crime has happened or after the incident has happened, the jury decides if it's a crime, and the person's making statements or the person's not making statements, is that all fair game up until someone is Mirandized and elects to maintain silence? So how I prosecute the case is uh, when, so pre-invocation uh, of the right, uh, I will uh, get into that uh, okay. if I believe it's, it's necessary. But usually I don't bring up uh, the discussions of the defendant unless there's a clear uh, uh, compelling reason to, because I want to force the defendant onto the stand. I want that defendant to be subject to cross-examination because more likely than not, they're going to slip up and say something that, like I just had a, a first degree sexual assault trial, where they said something that we had never heard before and uh, where we knew that the victim had been severely injured, uh, claimed, well, I didn't do that, and but I did everything else. Uh, so there, it was a great point for cross-examination, but before they invoke that right to silence, you can get into that, but uh, once they invoke, you really, you're not supposed to be getting into um, why they didn't say something, because they don't have to be a witness against them. That's a constitutional protection. The whole well, point of, you know, Miranda is that anything you say can be used against you in a court of law, but then there's times when the defendant, you know, the defendant does not have to take the stand in something like this. Uh, Kyle Rittenhouse did uh, put on a, a performance that has been judged, you know, one way or the other, depending on your feelings. Um, and even on, on this Wednesday, as this case is being, or as the show is being taped in the case of the, uh, the men who, uh, you know, shot down uh, Ahmad Arbery, uh, you had one of the defendants surprisingly take the stand in his own defense. So, Louis, I wanted to ask you about that. Is you know whether uh, you, as a prosecutor, don't have to make this decision, but uh, to what degree are you surprised or not surprised when you see a defendant decide to take the stand? You know, especially in a, in a case that's rather high profile. 
Well, it's always, uh, it's only the defendant's uh, uh, right or, or he has, he or she has the ability to stand, get on the stand or get off the stand. Uh, no one can force them onto the stand, uh, not their attorney, not the prosecutor, judge. If they get on the stand, then it's really a uh, fair game on uh, fair questions to that defendant on a, a wide variety of things. Uh, I like to uh, really get a narrative, talk about timelines, and really get into when their timeline is, is inconsistent with, with the witness's testimony prior to them getting on the stand in, in the defense uh, case. Uh, because the jury uh, really can see where there's holes, where they're not talking about something, and then we try to go into that area. Uh, but, um, you know, when the defendant does take the stand, though, sometimes it's against counsel's uh, advice. Their attorney is saying, do not take the stand. This is not going to go well for you. And right. a lot and, of times- Aren't you, when, when that happens, do, do you as the prosecutor kind of look at that as he's walking, he or she is walking to the stand and going, really? You're going to do that? Okay, well, you're game on. Well, I had a, I had a defendant who uh, on a child pornography, uh, largest pornographer in our county's history, a million images, videos. He uh, wanted to show everybody he was the smartest person in the room and that uh, his wife was the person who did all this. Well, the thing about it was uh, what he didn't know was uh, he wasn't the smartest person in the room. It was as, actually the DOJ analyst who uh, taught him a few things about uh, computer forensics, and I used that against him. And, and you know, I'll, I'll say this, you know, we don't get giddy when we make points, but when the defendant uh, used the uh, certain middle finger, uh, you know, right in front of the jury at me, I, I felt good because I, uh, I had made a point and he tried to make a point, but the jury knew that was a bunch of uh, hog, hogwash. There you go. All right, so I wanted to, <clears throat> I wanted to take it kind of a. We're, I love all this legalese, um, and it's and it's very kind of really cool to hear hear people in the profession kind of talk about how they go like the strategy of of, of winning a case. But I wanted to take it up a notch for our listeners. Can you tell us, Louis, what the ultimate goal is for this Rittenhouse trial? The DA's goal. What what are they trying to accomplish? I think that's that's just you know fact. But I want I want us to get all the, on the same page, and then if that happens or doesn't happen, what are the repercussions for Wisconsin? You've been an assemblyman, um, you know, what, and you know, you love, you love your state. What are the repercussions for Wisconsin, whether or not this goes one way or the other way? Well, the state filed its charges in Kenosha. Uh, that was uh, after their consideration of the evidence, and they presented their case to a jury of the defendant's peers. And clearly they are seeking convictions, otherwise they wouldn't have filed the charges. And ultimately, they're looking to hold the defendant accountable for those particular charges. Ultimately, at the end of this case, what I hope to come out of it is, is that one, there is uh, no more continued, no violence, obviously, on either side of the issue. However, you uh, agree or disagree with the filing or Rittenhouse or Mr. Blake. Uh, but I hope that the legislature and the people in, in North, Northern Wisconsin really understand that the power of self-defense and the power that the legislature has given the average person and law enforcement is great. Uh, and ultimately, the use of deadly force uh, in a particular fact pattern, that power actually, uh, un unbeknownst to most people, you have great power. And if you use that power, I hope it's used properly. But ultimately, it is very difficult to prove uh, someone guilty of a particular offense once self-defense is raised it reverts to the state to prove a negative that they didn't uh use it reasonably so you you brought up something interesting and i had my brother-in-law come up to me and say you know why are people giddy that these things are happening and it, it made me think about how we talk about these cases and that we're not giddy that there's an injustice but if there is going to be an injustice or a crime or a tragedy that the truth comes to light or that justice comes to light so i just want our listeners out there to hear when you hear when you say that we're giddy it's this feeling of righting a wrong providing justice to the community not you know da's who are celebrating you know evil because that's it, it, people who aren't in this world are like well, why are you happy like well you know we work hard to provide justice to the community um, and it's exciting when that actually happens and things can get a little bit better um, for the victims, the survivors, and the community right. large. And let's not forget, and in, in not going too far in Rittenhouse, but remember, there are two decedents. There are two people that are dead. 
and their family members have lost their loved ones. Uh, there's also a person that was shot. There's, uh, and for that person, a lifelong, uh, uh, that trauma is going to remain. And also uh, for the defendant, the trauma there of taking lives and putting himself in that situation of coming to Kenosha with a high-powered AR-15. So uh, at the end of the day, uh, justice is trying to make sure that this doesn't happen again. Right. Uh, you know, because even in northern Wisconsin, I remember as a kid, I mean, we got really upset at boat landings when people were just fishing for walleyes. Right. And people's right. lives were threatened. And I don't remember if anybody was killed. But, uh, you know, it's uh, right now we have a lot of hypersensitivity on politics and many different issues. I mean, I have people threatening school board members uh, about right. you know, making policy. Yeah. So people should take one thing away, which is this is real. If you take someone's life, you should be uh, uh, with the full eyes that, you know, you may be prosecuted and so, have to defend yeah. yourself. Louis, thank you so much. We really appreciate your time. It was great to see you again. And uh, thanks for your insight. Yeah. Thank All you right. very much, Pat, Kurt, right. Sarah. Well, more after this, you're up north. Welcome back to The Cabin. This is the Up North podcast, heard live on Wednesday nights on the radio and on the weekends wherever you find your favorite Wisconsin podcast. I'm Sarah Yakub, along with Kirk Bangstad and Pat Kreitlow. And uh, time for our next guest, UW-Wisconsin law professor Keith Finley. He's the author of more than 50 law review articles and book chapters. His primary area of scholarship and expertise deals with wrongful convictions, criminal law and procedure, law and forensic science, and appellate advocacy. He's previously worked as an assistant state public defender in Wisconsin, both at the appellate and trial divisions. He has litigated hundreds of post-conviction and appellate cases at all levels of state and federal courts, including the U.S. Supreme Court. He lectures and teaches internationally on wrongful convictions, forensic science, evidence, and appellate advocacy. Professor Finley joins us by phone. And uh, Professor, nice to have you with us. Thank you for joining us. Thanks. Thanks so much. I'm happy to be with you. Awesome. So, uh, Professor Finley, this is Kirk. Uh, thanks again for joining us. Um, I, I, I found you through an old friend of mine. I always, I always find these old friends from Wisconsin who just know some spectacular people. So I'm really happy you're, you've joined us. This is getting beamed up to northern Wisconsin, but you're live in Madison on the radio right now. And um, okay. um, we've just talked to Louis Malepsky, who was the DA of Portage County. And he, we went through kind of, you know, as a DA, what are we hoping to accomplish? Uh, kind of the ins and outs of the trial itself. Um, I wanted to move the conversation to... Um, you know, first of all, I'd love to hear, you know, whatever you're able to say about what you thought about this case and how it reflects upon the judicial system of Wisconsin. Personally, I think it was a bit farcical. Uh, I think that the judge was out of bounds a lot at times. And I, I just, I can't believe there's even a discussion, uh, even a question of whether a minor who who acted as a vigilante and actually killed people might get off. That's my own personal opinion. I'd like to hear your opinion, but I also want to bring it up a level. Understand um, if this if 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 Rittenhouse gets off, what are the repercussions for the state of Wisconsin and its judicial system, and potentially what are ways that we can um, I think uh, create create more justice? I guess in Wisconsin, sure. if if. You know, if it, this doesn't work out the way that I'm hoping it works out, which is he gets prosecuted or he gets sentenced. Yeah, there's so much going on in this case. There's so many levels at which one could examine it and, and, and think about it. Uh, I mean, from the purely legal level, what we've got is uh, a really difficult case, it, believe it or not, uh, under the laws as, as, they're, as they're written. Um, because it's it's a case where it's easy in terms of what happened. We all know what happened. We saw, you know, we've seen the videos. We 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 we've heard about all this stuff. But what makes it difficult under the law is that is that the law provides that Rittenhouse has a defense to shooting in killing two people, wounding a third, if he acted in self defense. That is, if he reasonably believed that he was in danger of imminent death or great bodily harm. And, and the, the emphasis there is on the word reasonable. That's why it gets really difficult is because the, the law doesn't provide much guidance to the jury in terms of figuring out what's reasonable. 
And so the individual jurors, essentially the legislature punted to the juries and said, you figure it out. or You tell us what's reasonable and what's not. The problem is in a case like this, where there's so such a wide polarized gulf between the views of me, the members of our, of our society, um, what's reasonable to one person is going to look entirely unreasonable to another. So, you, you know, there are people who, who, who are from the far right who support him and, 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 and really like the idea of gun-toting people showing up at, at, at protests on behalf of pe- black people who are who are uh, shot by police, and then there are people on the left who, who, who probably share your perspective. And so how the jury is supposed to come to a consensus and reach a unanimous verdict, it, it, it's going to be really, really challenging. So just at the level of the judiciary, that's, that's sort of the, the complexity that's involved there. But I really think you hit on something else there, and that is if you kind of zoom out and look at this not just under the technical terms of the legal statute, if you take that view of it, it's really kind of a b- bizarre scenario where you can have heavily armed teenagers showing up at politically fraught protests um, and putting themselves in a position where they might find themselves fearful uh, and where they, you know, it's sort of inevitable that somebody's going to get shot and yet. Uh, the, the law makes an accommodation for that. So I guess what I'm saying is that zooming out, the thing that I think is sort of the elephant in the room that all of the pundits are sort of overlooking is the very reason we're in this in this mess right now with this case is because our laws authorize people to show up at political events armed with semi-automatic rifles um, yeah. and to act... Yeah. And, and they can, you know, as minors and minors coming across state lines. And so I want to both you and uh, District Attorney Malevsky, uh, you know, really drill down on self-defense. And I want to get at that versus vigilantism here, because I- I'm sure folks hearing this are hearing, wait a minute, what, what self-defense do you have when you cross state lines with an automatic weapon and stir up trouble? Now, I, maybe the maybe the comparison is imperfect. Uh, forgive me for it, but we have such a uh, a culture and a debate about guns in this country that I want to set that aside for a moment, and we'll just do uh, you know an arsonist busts into a crowded theater and starts to set fire to something, but then somebody comes after him because hey you're setting fire to our theater, and uh, but the guy defends himself and he ends up you know you know killing a, a couple of the people in there, and yet he gets to claim self defense even though he's the one that was, you know, coming into that area that he did not belong in with potentially lethal force. But you're telling us, despite the the political overtones, despite the racial overtones, despite any problems we might see with systemic racism in the judicial system, the jury's just got to look at the specifics of this case. And it really is about, it it all peels away. And it's just, does self-defense apply despite what brought him to Kenosha. Is that, am I reading that right? Um, Partly, yes, but there's an important component to what you just said that we have to focus in on. And that is that uh, in the scenario you described, actually the person going into the theater and setting fires would not be able to claim self-defense because there's a principle known as provocation. And that is under the statutes, if someone provokes the response that makes them feel like their life is in danger, then they cannot rely on self-defense. That would clearly be applicable in the situation with the arsonist going into the theater setting fires. That would re- provoke a response from people in the theater to try to uh, you know, attack that person and, and, and neutralize them. The, the problem is that the provocation only uh, eliminates the self-defense claim if the provocation was itself an unlawful act, such as setting fire to the theater. That would be an unlawful act. And that gets back to the point I was making before. Going to a, under our laws, going to a politically fraught, racially tinged, you know, a public protest armed with semi-automatic rifles is not illegal. Is, that's and the amazing that, part. That is just amazing. crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. Yep. Well, I so mean... That's why, so that's why provocation may apply here. And the jury was instructed on that, 
But they'll have to decide that Rittenhouse actually did something not only that would provoke the attack on him, but that what he did was itself unlawful. Well, and the thing that's interesting to me twofold is one, where's the contributing to the delinquency of the minor for mom? But two, you know, Pat, going to what you just said, the jury doesn't get all the information. They get it filtered through a judge whom I can't speak freely about as a member of the bar. So <laughs> the the issue for me is we've got a situation where Kyle is heard, I believe he's even on tape, looking at people he thinks are shoplifters and says, gee, I wish I had my AR-15 so I could pick them off. That, or I could shoot them. That very clearly speaks to his intent but the jury never got the luxury of that. All they saw was, you know, in that moment, is he, you know, in fear for his life? And, you know, taking away those key insights into what his thinking was, and he was trying to be Mr. Tough Guy in Kenosha, um, you know, I, I think that makes it that much harder for the jury to get to the bottom of what's going on. Yeah, I think you've hit on what is probably if if there was a legal error made by this judge, I think that's the probably the strongest claim of, the, uh, of legal error, and that's because it, the judge excluded that because, as you know, un, under the law, there's a, there's a strong principle that you can't admit other acts evidence, that is, other things somebody has done, in order to prove their character or their propensity, and to show that they acted in conformity with that character trait or propensity on this occasion. That's what the judge was relying on and excluding it. And that's, that's fine as far as it goes. The problem is that that rule is littered with exceptions and, and, and basically says things that somebody has done or said in the past are admissible if they're, if they're relevant not to prove character or propensity, but to show something else that's really relevant, something like motive, intent, plan, and in, in a self-defense case where the whole question is what is going on inside his mind? Was he really acting out of a fear and a reasonable fear of death or great bodily harm? We need to get inside his head. We have no direct window into his head except what he said. That is the window into what he was thinking and doing. That is a clear statement of intent, of, of motive, that most courts, I really believe, would have admitted that evidence for that non-character purpose. And taking that away from the prosecution was a real body blow to the prosecution's case because that was such a critical point. I agree. I agree. So I want to take it, you know, I, I heard this uh, kind of uh, similarity or this scenario brought up, and I wanted to ask you uh, using this scenario. So if a if a person of color, uh, a black man went into, you know, like the Charlottesville white power rally uh, armed with an AK, a semi-automatic weapon, um, and then, you know, potentially provoked, you know, raise the ante a lot because, you know, of course that's going to happen. And the same similar thing happened. People, you know, you know, came at him and he started firing. Do you think in Wisconsin, this black man would have the same trial you think and, and potentially and you know and obviously i'm i'm asking this to because i think i, I think no but i wanted you to kind of explain right. it you know a hell of a lot more about you know criminal law and wisconsin judicial system than i do well of course theoretically they're supposed to right but the only way i know how to answer that is to say you just have to look at the the data Look at the track record of our criminal justice system, and the track record is not good when it comes to treating uh, black people the same way as white people. So, you know, could could a black person have the same trial as this and have the same? Sure, they could, but the chances are far less likely, just simply based on what we what we know about how our system operates. We know that black people are arrested at far higher rates for. Uh, for crimes, even where the rates of offending are the same as with white people. We know at the next step of the process, people, uh, people who are black people who are arrested for the same crimes are, are tried more often than white people. They're convicted more often than white people. They're sentenced to prison once convicted more often. So we know that at every step of the process, it's not a level playing field. So could a, could a black person, it, 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 
if the sort of the tables were turned and the races were reversed, could a black person expect a fair trial or be expect to be treated the same as a written house? They could be treated the same, but there's an awful high risk that they wouldn't. But Professor, what would you say to someone who says exactly that is why you know Trump's America is what they're fighting for, is we want to maintain this privilege that we get as a function of our skin color, and we don't want to be in the position of these people of color, and we know the inequities, and we were, we were, we're fighting to preserve them. I feel like we have this fight of trying to get people to understand the inequity where a substantial part of our audience is going, yeah, so I want to keep it that way. And how do we get people to understand the cost of injustice to everyone that this is, we're not better off treating a subsection of our society as second-class citizens, especially when it comes to justice? Boy, boy if I knew the answer to that, um, I'd, I'd be, I'd be, uh, uh, it'd be amazing. Um, I mean, that is, that is the difficult question. How, how do you get people to recognize their own privilege? How do you get people to recognize um, that the other is not something to fear, but to embrace? Um, I, I don't know the answer to that. I think, you know, it's a long, long struggle. I just hope that, um, that, that, that Martin Luther King Jr. was right. I hope he was right when he said, you know, the arc of the universe is long, but it bends toward justice. I, I hope that's where we're going. But it's, it's, it's a, there's a lot of bumps along the road, that's for sure. So, Professor, I think we got time for about one more question. And I just wanted to kind of take this at the, top, at the highest level. Like, how does Wisconsin stop this from happening in the future if Kyle Rittenhouse gets off for being a vigilant, a minor vigilante and killing people? How do we, how do we, how do we fix this? Well, as long as our politics are polarized, we're going to have volatile situations. As long as we have gun laws that allow people to carry semi-automatic weapons to protests or, or public disruptions, we're going to have dangerous situations where somebody's going to feel threatened and is going to shoot them. So we have to fundamentally change our attitudes, but also fundamentally change our laws, um, so that so that we don't create these kind of boiling kettles that are. I mean, this is it's just a recipe for disaster. So we got a lot of work to do. We really appreciate your insight on this, and uh, again, we. We're asking you questions with no easy answers, but uh, it's your insight that at least helps us see if there is a, a path to get there. University of Wisconsin Law School Professor Keith Finley, thank you again so much for joining us on the Up North Podcast. Thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, and, and we want to, want to note as well, uh, last year, Up North News, uh, uh, WI.com did a story on systemic racism in the judicial system. You know, some 66,000 Wisconsinites are on pro parole or probation all at risk of being locked up on a technicality. And uh, you know, about 40% of black people released from Wisconsin prisons are locked up again within three years. That tells you that there's a, a problem with the judicial system that needs to be addressed and we'll keep a, a focus on that. We'll be back after this, you're up North. <laughs> Welcome back to the Up North Podcast. I'm Sarah Yacoub. And I'm Kirk Bankstead. And I'm Pat Kreitlow. And uh, Kirk asked for the Masterpiece Theater theme because he's, he's going to get professorial on us uh, for the final uh, few minutes that we have together. Uh, you know, the show, again, is, is heard you know, live on Wednesdays and then all across northern Wisconsin folks listen to it as a podcast. And there's inevitably the comments when Kirk posts it over the weekend about why Monaco Brewing Company is so divisive and why can't we all just meet in the middle? Well, we figured there's going to be a lot of political discussions during Thanksgiving, a week when you got to talk to your crazy uncle or the crazy uncle thinks you're a socialist commie. So Kirk's going to put on his professorial cape and discuss, Kirk, <laughs> is there in fact a political middle where we can meet these days? So... The, the the short answer, uh, Pat, is is no, and I'll tell you why. But I wanted to uh, explain the academics behind why. So the first answer is that when an entire party bases its existence on the big lie that Biden wasn't elected legitimately, and then many people within that party are actively plotting to overthrow our government and install an authoritarian dictator. I mean, 
That's where's, one where's, side. <laughs> that's not really <laughs> middle there, is there? No. I mean, that's one side. So meeting that side in the middle, like where is the middle? You're still off a cliff if you try to find the middle to that. You know, so like the only, in, in, you know, the short way of saying it is the middle, the safe, if middle is not what you should be looking for, you should be fine reasonable. And reasonable is way left of what the middle currently is. And what that, you know, what that is really is, is there's this idea called the Overton window. And it's been like in, in a political science classes uh, for a long time. And basically this guy named Overton defined this window, which is, what is acceptable for like the majority of voters in America? What ideas are actually considered nuts? And what ideas are actually considered, oh, well, this kind of makes sense. Let's talk about this. So it's even the debate, like sometimes, like the, the perfect example is prohibition. You know, in like we passed an, a, a, an actual amendment that said banning all drinking, because that actually was what America wanted for a while. And then all of a sudden, like, oh, sh crap, we can't drink anymore. And then the whole Overton window shifted from banning drinking to allowing drinking. That's like the perfect example. So I think our Overton window has been moved so far to the right in terms of racism, misogyny, and nativist, you know, rhetoric that that the middle is no longer safe. And that's why the monopoly brewing company fights for the left. Does that make sense to you, Sarah? Absolutely. Well, and you know, it's, it's so frustrating, because if you talk to somebody, take the politics out of it, most people, they can come to a consensus of right and wrong, you know, whether we're coming to the table as parents, as grandparents, as neighbors, as faith based members of the community. And then once you insert the politics, and once you insert the position of someone's political party, then people start to justify. Um, people start to to get sort of strange, and that's where it starts to fall apart. And this really comes back to what I was talking about earlier, uh, talking to these folks, uh, you know, down in in Georgia, who you know at first we were just making small talk, and of course, then you know as things got you know a little deeper into the conversation, we realized there was some you know, disagreement on, on COVID type issues. And we, you know, thought, well, we, we know these are nice people. Let's just have this nice conversation. And, you know, by the end of it, things were getting rather animated. And I, I don't mean in like a bad way, it wasn't going to get like violent or anything, but you could just see that, that there was this clear disagreement in part because, and I think this falls into your, your scenario here, Kirk, is, you know, <laughs> there's, there's something that's now in the Overton window and that's being able to deny science. That, 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 you know, the COVID is just the flu and the vaccines are mysterious. And so however this window has moved, it, it has moved, I believe your notes called it crazy town, Kirk. Uh, the window is somewhere over crazy town right now. And we're looking to see if we can, you know, move it back uh, in one way or the other. And that only, that, that can happen several different ways. It can happen through elections, but that means that's happened through campaigns, or it just has to, to happen through continuous messaging over and over again pick on, say, the civil rights fight, okay? The law was passed in 1964, but for decades prior to that, the window was not there at all of accepting civil rights. Uh, and that's just one of many examples. So, Kirk, I, I appreciate you helping us explain where we're at and that it's not fixed forever, but it is going to take more of those conversations and more action to, to move us there. So thank you, Professor, for, for, that, uh, for that insight. <laughs> And with that, it is time for us to go. Thank you, Kirk. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you for joining us at the cabin. And to Keith Finley and Louis Malevsky, our guests, if you're hunting this weekend, please be safe. And uh, otherwise, have a great weekend. We'll talk to you next week. Hunting.